For one great power, it was the military disaster that ended decades of homogeneity over the German-speaking world. For the other, it was the victory that catapulted their nation into the diplomatic big leagues. In the summer of 1866, the Seven Weeks' War saw the Central European powers of Prussia and Austria go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, slugging it out for supremacy in a fight that was as nasty as it was short. But while it may have been over quicker than your average school summer vacation, the effects would be felt for decades to come. It was thanks to this one war that Otto von Bismarck was able to begin uplifting the German states, paving the way for the rise of Germany, that Italy was able to absorb the niche of advancing its own battle for unification, that the great empire, known as Austria-Hungary, was officially formed. All too often overlooked, semi-forgotten in the shadow of the larger Franco-Prussian War, this is the story of the Seven Weeks' War and the summer that changed German history. Sprawling over roughly 358,000 square kilometers, Germany today is one of Europe's largest countries, an economic behemoth beating at the continent's heart. Yet, had you opened a map in 1848, you wouldn't have found a single Germanic nation. Instead, Central Europe was carved up into a constellation of statelets and free cities, 39 in total, that together made up something known as the German Confederation. Created in 1815 from the ashes of the Napoleonic Wars, the German Confederation was intended by the Allies to be a rational replacement of the collapsed Holy Roman Empire. Only the memo apparently left out the rational part. With a dizzying set of voting rules that included federal representation of non-Germanic states like Britain and Denmark that just happened to have holdings in the area, the Confederation was less a slumbering giant and more a bunch of comatose schoolchildren. This was made worse by the fact that the only two serious powers among the 39, Prussia and Austria, were bitterest rivals constantly competing for influence. So perhaps it's no surprise that in 1848 the Germanic peoples looked around their crappy confederation and declared, you know what, we can do better than this. The continent-wide revolutions of 1848 upended the European order. But in the Germanic states, the eruption was especially volcanic. Riding a wave of nationalism, citizens of the Confederation tried to combine all their statelets together into a megazord called Germany, piloted by Prussian King Frederick William IV. The only problem? Frederick wasn't remotely interested. For Frederick, the idea of turning his shiny Prussian crown in for some drab, semi-ceremonial role leading a united Germany was even less appealing than the concept of France. Nor was the other great Germanic power on board. As a multi-ethnic empire, the only way Austria could join this new Germany would be by voluntarily surrendering its other possessions. And with the Hungarians already revolting, the last thing the emperor wanted was an excuse for more national to go rogue. Bereft of serious support, the United German Parliament had collapsed by 1850. Across Europe, most of the revolutions fizzled out. But that doesn't mean there hadn't been some big changes. In Austria, the old emperor had fallen, replaced by the dashing, soon-to-be extremely bewhiskered Franz Joseph. In France, the king had been democratically replaced by Napoleon's nephew, Louis Napoleon, who would soon not so dramatically declare himself Emperor Napoleon III. But perhaps the biggest change was in the fortunes of a minor Prussian noble. Otto von Bismarck had been known to Frederick William IV even before the revolutions of 1848, but it had been his steadfast support for the king during the upheavals that brought him into the limelight. And while it would take a few more years before he graduated to headline act, it was his rise more than anything that would soon facilitate the Seven Weeks' War. The other big post-1848 change was the effective collapse of the German Confederation. With the revolutions mostly over, the Confederation would need to be reformed, but it wouldn't happen on the same terms as before. In 1850, a new German uprising threatened the Elector of Hesse, who panicked and called in the big guns. Both Prussia and Austria rocked up with their armies, only to instead nearly wind up fighting each other, at which point Austria called in its own big gun, Russia. With Russia threatening to intervene on Vienna's behalf, Prussia was forced to back down. A humiliating agreement was reached at Olmutz, today Olomots in the Czech Republic, that effectively reformed the Confederation with Austria now at its head. But while the punctuation of Olmutz was a slap in the face for Prussia, it wasn't quite the final triumph Franz Joseph thought it was. Because Otto von Bismarck was by now starting to form the vaguest inklings of a plan, a plan that would soon see Berlin's humiliation reversed a thousand times over.
Depending on where you stand on the whole Bismarck always had a plan interpretation of history, the next decade plus can either be read as a series of strategic Austrian blunders that Prussia took advantage of, or the slow unfolding of a methodical plan to bleed the Austrian giant dry. The bleeding started not long after Prussia's humiliation with the 1853 outbreak of the Crimean War. A royal rumble between Russia and the Ottoman Empire that eventually dragged in other great powers like France and Britain, the Crimean War was the biggest conflict Europe had seen in decades. It was also a diplomatic nightmare for Austria. From the get-go, Russia kept on being like, Vienna, do me a solid and uh, attack the Turks. All right, go on now. But because Prussia was leaning the other way towards backing France and Britain, Austria became super nervous about leaving itself friendless in Central Europe. So they overcompensated, eventually joining a formal alliance with the Western European powers and asking the German Confederation for permission to declare war on Russia. At which point, Prussia executed their flawless rug pull. With Vienna now allied with Paris, it was easy for Berlin to sidle up to the minor German states and whisper, you know, Declaring war will mean a French army marching over your territory to reach Russia. Can you really trust those croissant munchers not to annex you on the way? Hmm? Oh, when the vote came, Austria was defeated. The German Confederation didn't declare war. Now, the overall effect on the war's outcome was minuscule, but it did leave Russia angry that Austria had turned traitor while also isolating Vienna among the German statelets. A small cut, in other words. A little slice that drew some blood, but from Franz Joseph's perspective, nothing to really worry about. But the thing about little cuts is that enough of them could quickly add up to a debilitating wound. The next slice came courtesy not of Prussia, but of Louis Napoleon. In 1859, the Italians launched their second war of independence against Vienna's holdings in their north. Eager to play the conquering hero, Napoleon III threw France's weight behind their bid. Together, the French and the Italians kicked Austria's butt out of northern Italy, leaving only Venetia under Vienna's control. The outcome of this war would turn out to be extremely important in Berlin. Chief of Staff Helmuth von Moltke took note of the successful tactics and immediately began applying them to the Prussian army, a key part of his drive to professionalize Berlin's forces. Bismarck, meanwhile, pushed the idea of an alliance between Prussia and newly humiliated Austria, one that would soon reap great rewards. But first, Prussia needed to get stronger. In January 1861, Frederick William IV died and was replaced on the throne by his brother, Wilhelm I. And Wilhelm was a guy even more into Bismarck than his brother had been. By 1862, it promoted him to minister president, effectively Prussia's civilian leader. What followed was a national transformation. This was the era of blood and iron when Bismarck hammered through plans to improve Prussia's economy and might, all while Helmuth von Moltke was creating a sleek fighting machine. By 1864, they had something nearly unique in Europe, a vast professional army led not by aristocrats, but by men with impeccable credentials in management and logistics. Now all they needed was an excuse to test out their new toy. It was an excuse Denmark would be only too happy to provide. In this era, Denmark and the German Confederation were constantly bickering over Schleswig and Holstein. Two tiny duchies, the pair were joined in personal union with Denmark, with the Danish king also duke of both independent statelets. But while their ruler was Danish, both Schleswig and Holstein had German majorities, majorities that in the heat of the 1848 revolutions had risen up against the Danes. Although the Danes had won the first Schleswig war, they hadn't annexed the duchies outright. Holstein even remained a member of the German Confederation. And that would turn out to be extremely problematic. In 1863, the childless Danish king died. Because Holstein only allowed direct male line succession, that should have meant its personal union with Denmark was over. But instead, the new king tried to cling on to Holstein, illegally asserting his dominance over a helpless member of the German Confederation. It would be all the Casas Valley Bismarck needed to both field test Mokka's new army and inflict on the Austrian giant the deepest cut of all. The summer of 1863 was a stormy one in the German Confederation's federal diet. To the north, the Danes were not only trying to hold on to Holstein, but also annex Schleswig outright. This led to a torrent of threats from the Confederation, with Saxony and Hanover announcing their intention to intervene if necessary. But it was only in January 1864 that it became clear the Danes were in serious trouble, because that was the month Bismarck finally convinced Franz Joseph to join his anti-Copenhagen invasion. 
The Prussian and Austrian tsunami that hit the Danish that February did to their body politic what regular tsunamis do to regular bodies swept them away. By April, the Danes had been carried out of Schleswig and Holstein, triggering a peace conference. When that failed, the tsunami simply rumbled on, washing over Denmark's mainland before finally depositing the Danes, coughing and spluttering onto the shores of defeat. The aftermath of the Second Schleswig War removed both duchies from Danish control, handing them jointly to Prussia and Austria. What followed was a year of bitter haggling over who got what until in summer of 1865 it was finally agreed to give Holstein to the Austrians and Schleswig to the Prussians. Known as the Treaty of Gastein, the agreement further stipulated that no other German states could interfere in the duchies running, a clause that would soon become all sorts of importance. So that's all nice and well, right? Each power gets one province and everybody's happy. Except, of course, that wasn't Bismarck's plan at all. At the same time Berlin and Vienna were haggling over who got what, Prussia's Mr. President was quietly doing the diplomatic rounds and he liked what he was hearing. In St. Petersburg, people were still pissed at Vienna for the whole Crimean backstabbing thing. In London, Austria's joint attack on Denmark had made them deeply unpopular. In Paris, Napoleon III was willing to ignore any moves Berlin made against his old enemy Vienna, so long as he got a piece of the pie afterwards. And with Louis Napoleon's help, Bismarck was also able to seal a treaty with the Italians, one which stipulated that they would get the last of Austria's holdings in Venetia if they joined a hypothetical war against Against them. And Bismarck absolutely said hypothetical with a big cheery wink. By the time 1866 dawned, then Franz Joseph was isolated on the diplomatic stage, potential allies either ignoring him or actively hostile. The one card Austria still had left was its position within the German Confederation, but Bismarck was confident he could get the statelets on his side. That March, the two great rivals began a slow but unstoppable process of mobilization, each new deployment triggering a reaction from the other, until war seemed to be inevitable. By the end of April, Vienna had called for full mobilization. That May, Mokka ordered railway lines to start depositing Prussian troops at the border of Bohemia, part of modern-day Czech Republic, but back then, inside the Austrian Empire. Clearly, conflict was inevitable. The Austrians were sure the Prussians were up to something, and Bismarck was only fanning the flames. In the end, though, the one who pulled the trigger would be Franz Joseph. On the 1st of June, Austria complained to the German Confederation that Prussia was interfering in its running of Holstein and asked for help. Since this pretty clearly violated the no other German states will get involved clause of the Treaty of Gastein, Bismarck was all like, ah, you broke the treaty. Time is a war, isn't it? June the 4th dawns with Prussian troops marching into Holstein. Although the Austrian garrison retreated rather than fight in the hopes of averting war, by now everyone was primed for the coming showdown. Eight days after the Prussians took Holstein, Vienna withdrew its ambassador to Berlin. Two days after that, the German Confederation had a vote. Hanover, Saxony, Bavaria, Württemberg, Baden, Hesse, Darmstadt, and Sau all agreed to raise forces to help Austria. So Bismarck just laughed, declared the German Confederation dissolved, and prepared to fight the lot of them. But not even the Man of Iron himself could realize just what a walkover the conflict would turn out to be. At the outset of the Seven Weeks' War, it would have been tricky to guess who might win. On the one hand, Austria had a population twice the size of Prussia, plus a whole bunch of German statelets on site. On the other, the Prussians were so militarized that their army's size matched Austria's, and they could also call on their Italian allies to attack from the south at any time. Yet anyone who focused on the relative strengths would have missed the real key development of the last few years. In terms of military tech, comparing Prussia to Austria was like comparing the culture to the crew of Red Dwarf. Prussian infantry were armed with new Dresden needle guns that could be reloaded rapidly from a kneeling or lying position. In the background, Motka had ensured multiple rail lines were ready to transport troops to sensitive points at what was then lightning speed. And high-speed shifts would soon become a hallmark of this war. One of the first fast strikes the Prussians needed to make was knocking out the other German states before they could concentrate their forces. While on paper, Austria had a formidable coalition, in reality, that coalition was scattered across Central Europe like soldier-shaped confetti. Hit the individual armies early, and you'd nullify one of Vienna's big advantages. 
The result was the war opening with a direct invasion of Bohemia, yes, but also the Prussian 13th Division steaming into Hanover and seizing the capital before Hanover's forces could even blink. On June the 17th, the city fell. Although Hanover's army gamely marched south towards the main action, they were quickly surrounded. On June the 29th, the Hanoverians surrendered, having fought just a single battle. It was the beginning of a series of dominoes falling like a house of cards, leading to an inevitable Austrian checkmate. The first victims of this chain reaction were the armies of Hesse under Prince Alexander and the Bavarians under Prince Charles. At the time the Hanoverians surrendered, Hesse and Bavaria were executing a plan to head south and link up, taking a dumb route that separated their two armies with the mountain range. The plan only made sense if the Hanoverians were able to keep the Prussians tied up, but Berlin had dealt with them practically on the first day of the war. The result was Prussian troops able to chase down two armies and then hit the Bavarians in surprise attack, smashing their forces at Dernbach. It was while staggering under this blow, damaged, demoralized, that the news reached the German troops of what had been happening in the Austrian theater, of the disaster that would utterly collapse their morale. So, let's talk about that disaster. While some of Prussia's forces had been off humiliating Hanover and Bavaria, Molke's main focus had been the three vast armies he had dispatched to Saxony and Bohemia. The first part of the plan had gone smoothly. As the Prussian army of the Alba crossed into Saxony, the Stadlitz soldiers under Crown Prince Albert had been forced to retreat, escaping into Bohemia. Saxony had fallen to Prussia by June the 16th. And now came the hard part. Molke's great idea was to use his three armies to drive the Austrians into a corner outside the town of Yichin, where, backs to the river Alba, they'd be forced to surrender. A simple plan in theory, but one that involved a ton of potential points of failure. Luckily, Prussia under Bismarck and Moltke was basically team plan. On June the 23rd, the Prussian First Army entered Bohemia. Three days later, the Second Army came in over the mountains. Now all that stood between them and ravaging the Empire's lands was Austria's North Army under Field Marshal Benedek. Little could any of the participants have known, but the coming battle would determine not just their fates, but the fate of Europe itself. You can tell from even the briefest glance at his communiques that Field Marshal Benedek was not confident about taking on Prussia. Pray conclude peace at any price, he telegraphed to Franz Joseph on July the 1st. A catastrophe is inevitable. Nor was he exaggerating. From the moment the Prussians first hit the Austrian North Army, the casualty rate had been staggering. In just the four days prior to the gloomy telegram, Benedek had lost some 30,000 men in skirmishes. Bismarck, Moltke, and Wilhelm I, by contrast, were so confident of victory that they left Berlin to come and watch the battle in person. Trapped near the Elbe outside Konigratz, today Hradetz Kralovy, Benedek could see the nightmare that was about to unfold. One that his own poor deployment of troops along a wide arc would contribute to. Even taking all of that into account, though, the disaster that was the Battle of Konigratz must have still come as a shock to everyone. Beginning with a volley from Prussian fusiliers at 6.30 a.m., the Battle of Konigratz was one of the largest engagements Europe had ever seen. It's 450,000 participants, making it only a bit smaller than the biggest battles of the Napoleonic Wars. An hour and a quarter after kickoff, Wilhelm and Bismarck reached Moltke's command post, a nearly fatal move, when a wild shell landed just 18 meters from Wilhelm, nearly blowing him up. But the king survived to see his army triumph. Now, since the ending of the battle was so one-sided, it's tempting to assume the entire thing was a rout, with Prussians chasing down and slaughtering Austrians. However, the first few hours were more matched, with Team Bismarck also taking heavy casualties. In fact, casualties were so heavy, leaving broken Prussian bodies all over the battlefield, that around noon, Wilhelm uneasily asked if there was a plan to retreat. To which Molke calmly gave his legendary reply, Here there will be no retreat. We are fighting for the very existence of Prussia. By now, though, victory was already assured. Just two hours after Wilhelm got cold feet, Molke's men executed a plan to take two hills overlooking the battlefield from where they began a brutal artillery barrage against the Austrians. A barrage so brutal that the Austrians simply broke ranks and fled. What followed was a human tide washing toward the Elbe and the handful of pontoon bridges Benedek had set up in case of retreat. So vast were the numbers fleeing that they got trapped in a bottleneck, one the Prussians happily used as target practice. Then Benedek, safe and dry on the opposite bank, gave the order to destroy the bridges, and everything went from bad to worse, and then from worse to apocalyptic. 
In panic mode, scores of soldiers tried to swim to safety across the river only to drown. The thousands that didn't were taken prisoner by the Prussians, 20,000 in all, on top of the 24,000 killed and wounded in battle. The Prussians, by contrast, lost a mere 9,000 men in total. From the opposite bank, tears of frustration streaming down his face, Benedek sent a telegram to Franz Joseph that simply read, The catastrophe I warned you of two days ago happened today, conveniently leaving out his own role in the casualty figures. Yet this wouldn't be the last catastrophe Austria faced. Not even close. As news of the debacle spread across Europe like a bloodstain flowering on a soldier's tunic, the tempo of the war shifted. In the south, the Italians launched their own attack, splitting Vienna's forces across two fronts. But it was in the German Confederation that the impact was most keenly felt. Demoralized, the Bavarian army broke off from its original plan of advancing south, hightailing it instead toward the defensible outpost of Würzburg. This, in turn, freaked out Prince Alexander of Hesse, who pivoted after them with the Federal Eighth Corps now in tow to stop himself getting picked off. But this created a serious problem. The Eighth Corps had been all that was standing between Prussia and the Confederation's federal dad at Frankfurt. Suddenly, the free city was utterly undefended, and there would be no stopping Bismarck from exacting his revenge. With what was now clearly Europe's sleekest war machine bearing down on them, the senators in Frankfurt did the only thing they could. On July the 15th, they declared their city open to the invaders. A day later, Prussian troops marched in. A day after that, they annexed the city along with the neighboring duchy of Nassau. With Hanover also occupied and other statelets falling fast, it was obvious the war wouldn't just end with Austria's humiliation, but also with the destruction of the German Confederation itself. The first to accept the inevitable was Austria. With Prussia in control of Bohemia and their forces encroaching on Upper Austria, Franz Joseph basically closed his eyes and muttered, Gott in Himmel, and accepted defeat. On July the 22nd, the Emperor communicated to Wilhelm that he wished to surrender. Remarkably, Wilhelm tried to refuse. With the road to Vienna wide open, he was already entertaining visions of Prussian troops marching through the imperial capital. But dismantling Austria wasn't part of Bismarck's plan. When he heard what Wilhelm was hoping to do, Otto threatened to hurl himself out of a fourth-floor window unless the king accepted his surrender. Wanting to see his best advisor self-defenestrate, Wilhelm grumpily agreed. With Vienna out of the fight, all that remained was a mopping-up operation against Bavaria and the remaining federal forces. Down near Würzburg, the Bavarian army and the Eighth Corps under Prince Alexander had once again come up with a plan that involved separating their armies to march to some distant goal. Once again, the Prussians attacked while they were divided, eventually forcing them to split in different directions, unable to combine their might. After that, there was little anyone could do to stop the slow-motion car crash. By August the 1st, the Bavarians were essentially trapped in Würzburg. That same day, the Prussians issued a demand for surrender. With the terms of a truce already hammered out, all their commander, Prince Charles, needed to do was hold out for another 24 hours and it'd be in the clear. But even that single day was by now demanding too much. Charles raised the white flag and Prussia's troops took the city mere hours before the truce came into effect. And with that, the active phase of the war came to a bitter end. Signed on August the 23rd, the Peace of Prague was a mixture of bad and extremely bad news for Prussia's opponents. For Austria, the news was merely bad. Franz Joseph was forced to surrender Holstein, pay 30 million silver florins indemnity, and permanently abandon any role within German politics. More painfully, he also had to surrender Venetia to the Italians. Painful because Austria had actually won the war in the south, but because Bismarck had promised to keep fighting until the Italians had their prize, Vienna was forced to give it up anyway. With that, Italian unification entered its final phase. Only Rome now remained outside Italian control, the last vestige of the Papal States under the protection of Napoleon III. Just four years later, the Franco-Prussian War would remove that protection, and Italy would be complete. Bad as the peace was for Austria, though, for the German states, it was catastrophic. Rather than negotiate, Bismarck simply annexed Hanover, Hesse, Kassel, Nassau, and Frankfurt into Prussia. He then created something called the North German Confederation and forced all states above the river Main to join it. Only Baden, Hesse, Darmstadt, Württemberg, and Bavaria remained independent. Yet while it was called a confederation, the North German Confederation was simply a vessel for Prussian dominance, a vessel that five years later would merge with those remaining independent states into a behemoth called Germany. But you'll have to watch our video on the Franco-Prussian War to see how that came about. The last major change came the following year 
in 1867. With his authority so weakened following the disastrous war, Franz Joseph was forced to forge a compromise with his empire's Hungarian minority to stop them declaring independence. From now on, there would be no mere Austria straddling Central Europe, but a dual monarchy known to history as the Austro-Hungarian Empire. With that, the ripple effects of the sharp, brutal summer war of 1866 faded. The deed had been done, the battle fought, and now everyone would live with the consequences. Today, the Seven Weeks' War lies at the more obscure end of European conflicts, often overshadowed by the larger Franco-Prussian War, if it's remembered at all. Yet, despite its lack of renown, it remains one of the most defining moments in history. Although they'd be completed later, the rise of Germany and Italy can both be traced to this one short war. Everything that came next, the German Empire, the war with France, World War I, all found their seeds in 1866. It may be semi-forgotten now, but the effects of this one short conflict continue to shape Europe to this very day.